This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 8. The Same to the Same. January. Our master is a poor refugee, forced to keep in hiding on account of the part he played in the revolution which the Duc d'Angoulême has just quelled, a triumph to which we owe some splendid fates. Though a liberal and doubtless a man of the people, he has awakened my interest. I fancy that he must have been condemned to death. I make him talk for the purpose of getting at his secret, but he is of a truly Castilian taciturnity, proud as though he were Gonzalvo di Cordova, and nevertheless angelic in his patience and gentleness. His pride is not irritable like Miss Griffith's, it belongs to his inner nature. He forces us to civility because his own manners are so perfect, and holds us at a distance by the respect he shows us. My father declares that there is a great deal of the nobleman in Signor Henares, whom, among ourselves, he calls in fun Don Henares. A few days ago I took the liberty of addressing him thus. He raised his eyes, which are generally bent on the ground, and flashed a look from them that quite abashed me. My dear, he certainly has the most beautiful eyes imaginable. I asked him if I had offended him in any way, and he said to me in his grand rolling Spanish, "'I am here only to teach you Spanish.' I blushed, and felt quite snubbed. I was on the point of making some pert answer, when I remembered what our dear mother in God used to say to us, and I replied instead, "'It would be a kindness to tell me if you have anything to complain of.' A tremor passed through him. The blood rose in his olive cheeks. He replied in a voice of some emotion. "'Religion must have taught you, better than I can, to respect the unhappy. Had I been a don in Spain, and lost everything in the triumph of Ferdinand the Seventh, your witticism would be unkind. But if I am only a poor teacher of languages, is it not a heartless satire?' neither is worthy of a young lady of rank. I took his hand, saying, In the name of religion also I beg you to pardon me. He bowed, opened my Don Quixote, and sat down. This little incident disturbed me more than the harvest of compliments, gazing and pretty speeches on my most successful evening. During the lesson I watched him attentively, which I could do the more safely, as he never looks at me. As the result of my observations, I made out that the tutor, whom we took to be forty, is a young man, some years under thirty. My governess, to whom I had handed him over, remarked on the beauty of his black hair, and of his pearly teeth. As to his eyes, they are velvet and fire, but he is plain and insignificant. Though the Spaniards have been described as not a cleanly people, this man is most carefully got up, and his hands are whiter than his face. He stoops a little, and has an extremely large, oddly-shaped head. His ugliness, which, however, has a dash of piquancy, is aggravated by smallpox marks, which seam his face. His forehead is very prominent, and the shaggy eyebrows meet, giving a repellent air of harshness. There is a frowning, plaintive look on his face, reminding one of a sickly child, which owes its life to superhuman care, as Sister Marta did. As my father observed, his features are a shrunken reproduction of those of Cardinal Jiménez. The natural dignity of our tutor's manners seems to disconcert the dear Duke, who doesn't like him, and is never at ease with him. He can't bear to come in contact with superiority of any kind. As soon as my father knows enough Spanish, we start for Madrid. When Henares returned, two days after the reproof he had given me, 
I remarked by way of showing my gratitude. I have no doubt that you left Spain in consequence of political events. If my father is sent there, as seems to be expected, we shall be in a position to help you, and might be able to obtain your pardon, in case you are under sentence. It is impossible for any one to help me, he replied. But, I said, is that because you refuse to accept any help, or because the thing itself is impossible? Both, he said with a bow, and in a tone which forbade continuing the subject. My father's blood chafed in my veins. I was offended by this haughty demeanour, and promptly dropped Senor Henares. All the same, my dear, there is something fine in this rejection of any aid. He would not accept even our friendship, I reflected, whilst conjugating a verb. Suddenly I stopped short and told him what was in my mind, but in Spanish. Henares replied very politely that equality of sentiment was necessary between friends, which did not exist in this case, and therefore it was useless to consider the question. Do you mean equality in the amount of feeling on either side, or equality in rank? I persisted, determined to shake him out of this provoking gravity. He raised once more those awe-inspiring eyes, and mine fell before them. Dear, this man is a hopeless enigma. He seemed to ask whether my words meant love, and the mixture of joy, pride, and agonized doubt in his glance went to my heart. It was plain that advances, which would be taken for what they were worth in France, might land me in difficulties with a Spaniard, and I drew back into my shell, feeling not a little foolish. The lesson over, he bowed, and his eyes were eloquent of the humble prayer, "'Don't trifle with a poor wretch!' This sudden contrast to his usual grave and dignified manner made a great impression on me. It seems horrible to think and to say, but I can't help believing that there are treasures of affection in that man. End of Letter 8 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On November 19, 2006, in Oceanside, California.